Okay, now it is my honor and my privilege to introduce you to tonight's keynote speaker. We've invited Lauren Green from Fox News. She is the chief religious correspondent. She has done some amazing things like she covered the Pope and um, she shines bright both um, inside and out. She is a beauty queen, y'all. She has a crown, but her true crown is from her King Jesus. And um, I am just so delighted for her to share a word with us tonight. So Lauren, please come up. Okay, I'm using my computer because the computer didn't talk to the printer. And um, I'm over a certain age, and we just don't do technology. It's just, so every like 30 seconds, I have to, you know, like uh, sign back in. Wait a second. But um, first of all, I want to thank Ms. Steve Phillips for inviting me to speak here. Um, this is an amazing, amazing uh, conference, and it's an amazing that you're all podcasters and digital ministry, and you've come together. And that's, that brings strength, you know? It just brings incredible strength to the gospel and to his church, because that's what it's all about. Um, again, I want to thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this is kind of like prompter size because that's what I do. Um, the last time I was at the NRB was about five years ago, and it was actually uh, to promote my book, Lighthouse Faith, my one and only book, by the way. I, I'm so almost jealous, you know, that's not good. That's one of the seven deadlies um, of people who are like, oh, I'll just write my next book, and I'll just write my next book. Okay, so it's been five years, but that one, the first book took, actually took me 10 years. So I figure five years, I'm still in good standing right now you know, for the next book. So, yeah. Um, the book is called um, Lighthouse Faith, God is a Living Reality in a World Immersed in Fog. The um, God is a Living Reality in a World Immersed in Fog was kind of the publisher's idea. And I, I agreed with it. It's kind of nice. I, it was just God is a Living Reality because that was really more the focus that I wanted to bring because about... Probably, you know, 15 years ago, um, I realized that knowing God was the most important thing in the world. You know, J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. And it just, it hit me like a ton of bricks that there was nothing more important in this life. It's like, you can't, you can't walk unless you've got this understanding of how your legs work. I mean, and for most of us, it's natural, but you still have to try it. It's like when you're on the airplane and they say, you know, when the mask comes down, if the mask comes down, put your mask on first and then help somebody else. And to me, that book was saying, know God so that you can present him to somebody else. So that was what it was all about. And that was about 15 years ago. You know, we write books to help people, to help ourselves, to help a hurting world, um, sometimes for our own hurts. and in healing ourselves and healing, trying to understand ourselves and how God can help us and how Jesus can help us, um, we help other people. Now, the irony about faith is that it is personal. And it's personal because we all have a unique relationship with Jesus Christ in that we all have a different path. We've all had different experiences. We all have unique DNA. That, and that unique DNA has given us unique experiences, and so we have a unique relationship with Christ, because we are all unique. Now, but the faith is also communal. We are part of a community. We are part of the body of Christ. Not everybody, like Apostle Paul talks about, not everybody is supposed to be an arm or a leg, or, you know, it, we're all part of the body of Christ. And so it's very important, like Misty was talking about, you know, know your strengths. Know who you are, because sometimes, you know, when, when she was talking about the, the mom podcast, who would have thought, you know, you've, I mean, I work in New York, you know, you've got executives at NBC and ABC, and nobody would have thought of that. 
because, and they wouldn't think it would sell because they didn't think of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I come to them with ideas all the time. It's like, mm, you know, they ghost me all the time. It's like, I mean, it's like you know, and then I see it on 60 Minutes. <laughs> really? So, but it's like you're living in this community. We're all part of a community of believers as well as this individual relationship. And, and, and we live in this community that not everybody's a Christian, so we live in a broader community. Um, so the personal and the community faith is in constant struggle, constant struggle. And what I've discovered in the years since writing the book and researching the next book is, is that de the devil's really busy. The devil is indeed the prince of this world. And you, couldn't, you can't tell people this, you can't tell secular people this because they'll think you're like, ooh, you know, oh, <laughs> religious folks, you know, you're gonna watch them. But, you know, film producer Alex Kendrick, you know, the Kendrick brothers, um, he's been on the podcast. I've been very, very, very um, privileged to interview some of the most fantastic people, um, film producers like the Kendrick brothers and great theologians like N.T. Wright, um, Peter Kraft, um, just incredible, incredible minds. Um, but he told me uh, during their, their movie, every movie they produced, they were spiritually challenged but attacked in the specific area that the movie was about, right? So you know their movie Fireproof, it's about marriage. Their marriages were under fire. Things that didn't even become an issue, all of a sudden became an issue, right? The devil's busy. When they made Courageous, it's about the importance of fatherhood. Their own father was having some um, physical and mental and spiritual problems, their own father. So. I feel the same way because when I, when I wrote Lighthouse Bay, the God's presence and strength became so real to me. Um, I was having issues, uh, you know, there were changes, you know, changes at work, changes in family, changes in everything, and um, the Lighthouse imagery became this rock symbol of God's presence. It really was God's presence to me because it was a picture, an old gray lighthouse that I'd seen in a friend's house forever. And I looked at it one day, and all of a sudden I realized God has always been with me. Always been with me. But I was so wrapped up in my own issues that I never saw it. Um, and it takes being with a people who are of, of great faith. This woman that I talk about in the book, and she has, she's an elderly woman, and she has incredible faith. Um, and I call her my spiritual mentor. Um, but my own faith started to become foggy as well. and so. You know, it became apparent to me. I, where is all this evilness coming from? And it's and it's like Paul wrote in the Apostle and in, in, uh, Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians six: We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against spiritual hosts of uh, hosts of, of, um, of wickedness. We are wrestling against spiritual evil. The idea that behind every thought are spiritual forces, constantly at battle constantly a battle and we're and we are to put on the full armor of god you know um paul told the corinthians the god of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of christ who is the image of god the gospel of john assures us the ruler of this world has been judged you know satan may may parade around like a prince but jesus is still king jesus is still king jesus is still king so let's talk about the fog, the fog that we're immersed in, uh, that I'm a part of, everybody's a, far, a part of. Um, this is a fog where the devil is a defeated foe, right? But he's like a wounded dragon, right? A wounded animal is still dangerous, right? You don't touch a lion that's been wounded. You don't touch a wounded dog. They're very dangerous. So that tail slashing around is still dangerous. But if there's been an overall grayness in fog, and it's gotten foggier and foggier, in the Western world, it's the old lie that started in the garden. It's really the same old lie. It's the same old lie, and it never, it never just never gets old, you know? For Satan, it's the gift that keeps on giving. It is the lie that says, tacitly or explicitly, I am my own God. And today it's just taken a whole new level. Um, 
when I was young, uh, we call them the good old days, you know, before cell phones. I don't know if anybody here, any of you are under, you know, they didn't have cell phones. They had pay phones. <laughs> and one phone in the house. And there was no voice messaging. It just <laughs> rang and rang and rang until somebody picked it up or somebody got tired of ringing and just hung up. Okay, that was the good old days. But in the good old days, um, it used to be morality was something that's objective and exists outside of myself, right? And I have to form my life to that objective reality. And that's how we all grew up. Why did, you don't do that, why? Because I told you so. That's an objective reality on your, on your, in, your, in your household, you know, there's, it's, you know, your household is not a democratic society. It really isn't. It's, it's a dictatorship, really. Yeah, if you're parents, you know that. It's a dictatorship. But, but okay, but the idea is that that dictatorship inside your own household, your mother is saying the morality is outside because I said. But the larger picture, even in the community, even in the civil community, the secular community, morality is, is, exists outside of me. There's an objective truth to which I must mold my life to. Right? That is how it used to be. And then came the 50s and the 60s, and heaven help us, the 70s. <laughs> Free to be you and me, right? Now, it's the me, myself, and I generation. It morphed into morality that began inside of me, not an objective standard, but feelings trumped facts, feelings more powerful than faith, Feelings, oh, Barry Manilow would be very happy with that. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. And you know when the Bible says, whoa, it's not a good thing. <laughs> woe to those who make good evil and evil good. Isaiah never spoke more true words from what's going on today. We have now become our own golden calves. That is the world today. Only we don't recognize that it's a golden calf because it's me, myself, and I. I am the good, I decide what's right and wrong, and you have to mold your life to me. Society has to mold your life to me. Um, the idol of the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, every time I read it, every time I think about it, every time I see the movie The Ten Commandments as well, it just reminds me that when you look at a movie and see it, you don't see it in yourself. You never do. And if we can do anything with podcasts and the digital marketing is to understand how we need to bring that imagery into the 21st century. So people understand that you're never far away from Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. You know? Um, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, um, Whoa, session interrupted. <sighs> That's not good. <laughs> you know, God's gonna get me because I remember once I looked, I was speaking at a conference years ago and the young gentleman brought up his phone and the phone lost power. And I mockingly and snarkily said to him, oh, I got two words for you, hard copy. <sighs> <laughs> Thank you, I've been humbled. All right, so Dr. David Martin Lowe Jones, writing in the 50s in his book, Truth Unchanged, Unchanging, it's a great book to get. He, he talked about the cult of self-expression, right? The cult, not like, oh, free to be you and me. No, the cult of self-expression, where passion equals truth, right? And he warned about it. This is in the 50s. And he used the adage, and I'll never forget this because it stuck with me so hard. He says, fire makes a good servant, but a bad master. You can burn down a house if you light a fire in the living room on the couch, but in a fireplace, it can warm the house and give it warmth and light, right? Makes a good servant, but a bad master. John Stott wrote about, uh, in his iconic book, The Cross of Christ, he says that uh, self-absorption has even infiltrated the Christian church saying that the command to love our neighbor as ourselves has been skewed to meaning love myself before loving God. These, these are really 
dangerous times we're living in because it's so easy not to see God and to see ourselves. Um, and he, Stott also talks about um, a book by Dr. Paul Witz called Psychology as a Religion, the Cult of Self-Worship, where he says psychology has become a religion, in particular a form of secular humanism based on worship of the self. Now all you have to do is look at what's happening today. You can see that um, Christianity has always been on a collision course with secular um, society, uh, but the 21st century has, uh, now the 21st century has seen it um, gone to incredible levels. I mean, escalating doors, open doors um, USA, if you're familiar with the open doors to USA that always gives a world watch list of the 50 top countries in the world where it is most dangerous to be a, a Christian. And David Curry, who is the um, founding um, president of, um, of Open Doors, um, I always have him on to talk about the list because I think it's good to remind people that Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. You, you won't know that in, in secular media. You won't hear that. But the numbers prove Christianity is the most um, persecuted religion today. You know, not 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 fifteen hundred years ago, or not you know you know whatever. Today, it is the most persecuted religion. And he usually talks about the normal cast of characters: North Korea, China, Nigeria, a lot of Muslim majority countries, and secular communist regimes like, you know, um, you know. Look, of course, I mentioned China, um, but they threatened Christians with physical harm, imprisonment, persecution, death. And each time I like to bring out into that conversation um, that the persecution is tailored to the region, right? Tailored to the region, the threat of physical harm, um, it, it's, it's like that, the, where they can do physical harm and death and um, enslavement, they do it. The devil does it. But here in the West, persecution is not quite as obvious. It's legal, it's political, it's sociological, it's Jack Phillips the Baker, it's the culture wars over abortion, marriage, transgender athletes, right, uh, LBGTQ rights versus religious rights, the battle over how we'll educate our children, critical race theory. These are all the playground, you know? I remember hearing a Baptist minister years ago talking about the devil's legions of people who come out and, you know, do evil in our world. And it was actually almost a scarier version of the screw tape letters, if you can imagine. Because he talked about the devil's legions. You know, they've got the kings and the queens to deal with, you know, this, this corporate CEOs and, you know, the, 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 the heads of colleges. Got rooks and knights to deal with, you know, middle managers. You've got pawns to deal with everyday people. You've got legions of people to deal with every little thing that we do. Spiritual forces of evil that are at, at work. But these are all part of the same sin that began in the garden. Now we all know the fall from grace. We all know the fall from the grace that, you know, that Eve ate the apple, tempted. Did God really say that? Did God really say that? And of course the, the idea was that, you know, she didn't trust God. That we decided to be our own um, saviors, our own God, put ourselves in the place of God. But the working order of that and this is, why it's, this is why my podcast actually starts really getting into these ideas. The working order of the fall from grace is the separation of God's love from his law. You see what I mean? You separate God's love from his law. Now you've got, and you can, there are so many different examples. I want you to give the example of the sex, sexual revolution because I think that's the one that's really had the most impact on us. If you decouple sex from marriage, right, you do more damage in the long term, and we're still kind of suffering from it. You know, you've got children born out of wedlock, uh, children that means their children born never knowing their fathers or having a relationship with their fathers, in some cases even their mothers because we started to rent wombs. Um, children have become a commodity, an accessory that can be bought or sold or even killed. And that's why I say you've got the power to fight the power of Satan. I always think is, well, first of all, it's prayer. You know, prayer is going to be your first line of defense. But a podcast, especially the kind of podcasts that are out there with your strengths, that's another way to fight the power of Satan um, and putting on the full armor of God. You know, I've been extremely blessed 
to have um, been given this podcast, and it was not something that I sought. I didn't even know what podcasts were. You know, Fox was expanding their platforms and digital and then streaming and radio, and they said, hey, why don't you do a podcast? Um, and they said, well, what do you want to name it? And I said, well, I guess I'll name it after the book because that made sense. But the tagline I want to be moving forward in truth and love because that, to me, was where my heart was in trying to bring together these two elements of truth and love. Um, and I want to give you the synopsis of the book because I know it's been out five years and I don't know if anybody has read it or known anything about it, but I was here five years ago um, talking about it. But it basically, um, the book is premised on the fact that God's law is an expression of his love, right? You don't have law and then God brings in love, right? God is love. So law is an expression of his love, not the other way around. Law is an expression of God's love. God is love, so he gives laws. You know, um, so I looked at the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are not just an arbitrary set of rules and regulations, right? Because they want to, they, they usually, a lot of secular people would say, well, you know, um, those laws exist in, in other cultures. And I said, yeah, they probably do. But, you know, one of the reasons is because God puts his law on every human heart. And, and so it stands to reason that every community, every, every um, culture would have some derivation of those laws. But if you look at how the laws are structured, it's not an arbitrary list, but an actual description of who God is. The first commandment is the key. It's the light. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. That's a fact as well as a commandment. There are no other gods but God. And the commandments 2 through 10 are relate first to the first commandment and then to each other, right? Their identity is from the first commandment, right? Everything goes back to the first commandment. You can't break laws 2 through 10 without first breaking number 1, right? You can't steal unless something's more valuable to you than God. You cannot murder unless your sense of justice, you want to trump God's. You can't commit adultery unless somebody else's love is more desirable than, your, than God's. So that's the premise of the book. And what I found is that you see this concept in everything. You see it in architecture. You see it in biology. You see it in music. And I'm a musician, so I understood the idea that the diatonic scale operates very much the same way of the tonic. And then every other note in a scale relates first to the tonic and then to each other. That's how the music works. And music is vibratory. So the relationships are based on their vibratory nature. Man did not create it. So it's there. In biology, um, I did uh, an interview with the convent in Summit, New Jersey, that has a replica of the Shroud of Turin that researchers used to practice on before they went to the actual Shroud of Turin in Turin, Italy. But the miracle of it was the same DNA blood is on the replica that's on the Shroud of Turin. They don't know how it got there. It, it, well, I mean, it was placed on the Shroud of Turin, so it actually has the same blood. But one of the researchers said he could not believe when he, when he actually drew a picture of the blood hemoglobin, it was in the shape of a cross. Look it up. Right? Now, architecture. I interviewed a theoretical physicist, and he says, you know, every building has to stand up with the, with the right triangle, the Pythagorean triangle, right? What's a triangle? What's a right triangle? One quarter of a cross. Physically, every building in the world is held up by the cross. Every building. So, it was extremely important for me to understand this concept of truth and love. Um, human, temperance be, human temperaments mean what they are. Usually we kind of go by, you know, some people are more about love, some people are more about um, truth. But God doesn't separate these two. He never has. We do. Je 
Jesus is the Lion of Judah, and he's a lamb that was slain. He is fully human and fully divine. Oh, I have to do a little sidebar about the name of Jesus, by the way, and you might actually want to take notes on this because doesn't it just get you upset when you hear somebody say the name of Jesus Christ and they're not using it to praise him? Why is it okay to profane the name of Jesus in a public setting, but it's not okay to praise him? Right? Every time I hear that in a meeting and people think they're being cool, oh, his name of Jesus, the next time I hear that, and, and I want to do this, I haven't done it yet, but you might take notes, maybe you can do it too. <laughs> if I'm in a like, public setting, and I thought about going to like, my you know, boss and saying, you know, I really get uncomfortable when people start using the Lord's name in vain, and, and I thought, okay, they're going to be thinking that I'm going to be the whole, well, okay. I said, how can I do this truth and love, right? It's about be truth, but it has to be loving. And so the next time somebody does that, I'll say, oh, Jesus, do you mean the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me? Do you mean that, Jesus? <laughs> oh, or maybe, you need, or maybe the Jesus had said, of whom it is said, and at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven on earth, and every tongue will confess that he is Jesus Christ. He is right. He is the Lord. Do you mean that, Jesus? Or do you mean another? It's like, okay. So maybe try that the next time. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> I just, I just, ha I get so upset, and then I, I can't watch movies now because they just throw it out there. Anyway, Law and Love. I, I want to bring up three podcasts because it really is an expression of how I like to do a variety of things, but it's still very much part of the theme of Law and Love, of Truth and Love. I don't know if you know about um, Dr. Paivi Resonant. Do you know about her? She is a member of the parliament in Finland, has been for 27 years. Um, they just completed her trial. She's been on trial for hate speech against a minority because she quoted the Bible. 27 years, a member of parliament, and she was on trial. So this is a, about a 30 minute podcast with her. And this is why I like podcasts because you can really hash it out. You can really let her give her voice. Whereas we do a news story and we do, I did a news story as well on her, but the news story was about um, a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. The podcast is 30 minutes. You can see where you have more power in the podcast. Um, it, this is what happens when, when a community's morality is no longer an objective or external, right? It's no longer the law. She's a member of parliament, and she wrote, um, she wrote her Lutheran minister, actually she tweeted her Lutheran minister, questioning whether, why they were supporting the gay pride parade, right, the Lutheran ministers, and giving quotes from the Bible. That ignited a national debate about the Bible, the Bible says about homosexuality, um, and it questioned everything that she had written. She had wrote um, a pamphlet in 2004 that they brought up. Uh, but something happened in the trial that I think is, it, anybody who is a Bible-believing Christian should, it just would raise a red flag. Dr. Rossenden talked about sin and how God loves the sinner but hates the sin, right? The, we all know that because Jesus died for sinners. The prosecutor could not wrap her brain around that concept. She says, no, you have to love the whole person. You can't just separate what they do and with who they are. See, it's... The problem is there is no theology there. She has, she has such a limited understanding of theology. And this is why podcasts are so important. I don't know anything about theology. I don't know anything about Noah and the flood. This is why a movie can be made about Noah that has nothing to do with Noah and the Bible. <laughs> and no one will know the difference. Um, the other thing that was very, very troubling. Um, the prosecutor actually compared the Bible to Mein Kampf. You know, Hitler's manifest. Um, and she said it was okay to say certain things in the Bible, but it was not okay to believe it. Which you're basically seeing an example of someone being prosecuted for what they believe, not what they do, but for what they believe. 
And these are the red flags you have to start to raise. Now, the other podcast that I'm, I was so excited about, um, and I still, I had to actually do two because um, it was so fascinating. It's Dr. Michael Gillen. He wrote a book called Believing is Seeing. And this idea that science and faith are, you know, bad bedfellows that, you know, you, 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 you can't be science, scientist if, you, if you're a person of faith is, is really hogwash. And it has been hogwash for a very long time, except that the secular media doesn't want to believe it. I mean, you've got people like Dr. Francis Collins, you've got Dr. John Lennox, you've got Dr. Hugh Ross, um, you've got all of these scientists out there who are strong believers, and the list is growing. But Dr. Michael Gillen wrote a book called Believing is uh, Seeing, and he was an atheist, and who came to faith um, really by exploring all, every religion. I mean, this is a man, he's a very smart man, he's a physicist, astronomer, and a mathematician. Uh, former Harvard professor. Uh, you might have seen him as a science um, uh, commentator on ABC. Um, but when he was an atheist, he looked at every holy book and he started reading the Bible. And he got to the words of Jesus and his scientist's brain went like, what? When he got to the phrase, the first shall be last, he says, that's that's the language of quantum physics. The first shall be last. And he said, um, he said, science and Christianity actually are more paired than science and atheism. He says, for example, he says, atheism believes there are no absolute truths. And yet both Christianity and science say there are. Right? Um, he said, um, in science, light is sacred. Light is sacred. You understand light is constant. It's a constant speed of light, right? mc equals e squared. The speed of light um, times mass squared. Mass times speed of light squared. Um, mc's, okay, I'll, energy equals, okay, I got it right. E equals mc squared. Energy equals, okay, okay, we got it right. Anyway, the idea is that the whole theory of relativity is that energy and, 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 and mass are actually the same at a certain speed of light. That's the idea. What light has, he says it's sacred because light is, light is both wave and particles. Science has proven that they, light is both, both. It operates like a wave and operates at particles, right? It's the, called the wave-particle duality. When Jesus appears suddenly after the resurrection, out of nowhere, Michael Gillen's brain says, that's quantum physics. We take it on faith. But he says, if, if the God of the universe created the whole universe, he understands how it works. He understands wave-particle duality, but it also says, I am fully human, I am fully man. This is a quote that he says about that. He says, it's purely quantum mechanical, and quantum mechanics now proves us, uh, provides us with explanation for that. So now the Bible is more credible than ever. But I have to give a, a, you know, just one caveat here. Science is not the test to see whether the Bible is true or not. Science does not have that ability. Science tells us what is, but not what should be. Right? Science does not give us morality. I, mean, I, I love Dr. John Lennox's explanation. It says, you know, science can tell you what will happen when you put um, strychnine in your Antilles tea, but it won't tell you whether you should or not. <laughs> That's another level. The last podcast that I want to talk to you about is, is one that I always love, and I would love having more. I mean, I, I love a lot of podcasts, but I always have, he always brings a tear to my eye because he speaks to my heart. And that's Pastor Max Lucado. You know, his book, 316, The Numbers of Hope. And this is where God is at work. And I know God is at work in my life. Pastor Max has had some, you know, health issues. And, um, and I hesitate to ask about if he's available or not. And, his publicist came to me about a week or two weeks before and says, uh, Pastor Max is available on this day and no other day. Do you want him? 
yeah, okay, sure, fine. And this is the book. Didn't get the book in time. Got the book the same day. And it was, it was on 316. And it was really an important time. Because if there was a fog in my life, it was at that moment in life. Um, my mom had just passed in October. And uh, COVID, she's 98. She had a good life, but it was hard. Um, and my sister-in-law was dying of COVID. And you start to kind of hold on to life in any way you can. And Pastor Max Lucado came on. And it was an example of sometimes we need more of God's love than his law. You know, fine setting boundaries, all of that. Um, and he said, you know, there's, there's a reason that John 3.16 has become the life verse for so many people. And I believe it's because each word is an open door to the great ideas and the great promise of scripture. And every word can lead us into a pastor, if you will, of peace and rest. And every word can lead us to a deeper understanding of why we are on this earth and who God is. And I, he says, every phrase invites you into a place of promise and hope. And I think of Peter encountering Jesus after the resurrection. And he had just denied him three times. And Jesus asked, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, I do. And he tells him, feed my sheep. He asks him again, Peter, do you love me? He says, you know I love you. Feed my sheep, he says. Three times Peter denied him, and three times Jesus asks him, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, I love you. He says, feed my sheep. You want to end wars? Feed his sheep. You want to create great families? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Whatever podcast, whatever ideas you may have, it's all part of the body of Christ. Feed his sheep and feed his sheep and never stop feeding his sheep. Amen. Amen. I'm going to take one minute. I have an award. I just want to honor Lauren for um, her amazing work that she does for the kingdom and um, in working for a news organization and in the media. So I want to present you with this Lifetime Aww. Achievement Award from Spark Media. Oh, so thank, thank you, you so for much. all that you do and thank you for um, being here with us this evening. So thank you so uh, thank much. Thank you so much. It's going right on the piano. Good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Take that. Okay. Hello, everybody. Miss Lauren, thank you so much. That was beautiful.